Hey everyone, Dr. D here. In this uh, video, we are going to be covering chapter 12 as well as chapter 21. Uh, it's covering eukaryotes, microorganisms that are eukaryotes, and doing a survey of these microorganisms. So let's get started. To start our tour of the eukaryotes, we are going to begin with the protists. Remember, protists are uh, usually single cellular. Usually they grow in moist areas. They are eukaryotes in taxonomic flux, taxonomic classification flux. What does that mean? What that means is that there is no kingdom protist. There is no particular phyla for protists. Protists can be found in uh, various uh, different uh, various different phyla, various different kingdoms. So you could find a protist that's classified as a plant. You could find a protist that's classified as a uh, animal. Okay, and they are polyphyletic. That's what that means. Polyphyletic means that they can, protists can be found in various phyla. Now, because or these protists are not in a particular phyla, they do not use formal hierarchical rank designations such as phylum, class, or order. Instead, they are classified into supergroups. There are supergroups of these protists. For example, the supergroups include Excavata, Amoebozoa, Chromoaviolata, Archeplastida. These are the four supergroups of protists. So we're going to talk about these supergroups. We're going to talk about the first supergroup, Excavata. Excavata includes the Fornicata, Parabacilia, and the Euglenozoa. Most of these possess a cytosome, which is a suspension feeding groove. So let's look at the first type of excavata, known as fornicata. Uh, these are microaerophilic protists. That means they grow where there's low concentration of oxygen. An important member you should know about is Giardia. This is Giardia here, Giardia. Uh, and the reason you should know about Giardia as uh, your uh, example for Fornicata is that Giardia causes traveler's diarrhea. If you've ever heard the saying, don't drink the water when you visit uh, areas, um, you know, uh, other countries, uh, where the water treatment may not be so good. The reason you don't want to drink the water in some places is because you might pick up this protist. You might pick up this parasite called Giardia. This causes diarrhea, traveler's diarrhea. Let's talk about Euglenozoa, again, a type of excavata. Euglena is the representative and euglena are interesting because they are photosynthetic protists, right? These are photosynthetic right here. You can see that they have chloroplasts inside. They also have the feeding groove. You've got a flagella. You've got a pigment spot here. That spot directs the organism towards light. It's very interesting. How about pathogenic euglena? Uh, remember these? We talked about these earlier in the chapter, or, or I should say in the semester. The trypanosomes. Remember trypanosoma? Oftentimes they are blood parasites and they exist inside of your blood fluid, but outside of your blood cells. So here what I'm circling would be a blood cell. This would be your trypanosoma. Trypanosoma are usually parasitic. They're spread by vectors such as the tsetse fly, which spreads African sleeping sickness. Um, you can also have them spread by the kissing beetle. Uh, let me give you an example. Trypanosoma cruzi 
is the species that causes Chagas disease. You can find this in uh, Central South America. And it's spread by the vector, the kissing bug. It looks like a beetle that basically will bite you somewhere around the lip region while you sleep. And that's why it's called the kissing beetle. Because you wake up, uh, you have an itch somewhere close to your lips. You scratch that. That introduces the trypanosomes into your stream, into your bloodstream. And now you have a uh, trypanosoma infection with trypanosoma cruzi and this causes Chagas disease which is actually a very deadly disease uh, it can be a deadly disease Chagas disease the trypanosomes go into your bloodstream and they can cause major heart issues and uh, ultimately heart attack and death African sleeping sickness is caused by this creature here trypanosoma gambiense trypan uh, trypanosoma rhodiense uh, this causes African sleeping sickness. It's spread by the tsetse fly. It's basically a, a uh, biting insect. Let's talk about the next group. We're moving on from excavata onto amoebazoa. Let's talk about the amoebazoa. You guys know what amoeba are. We already talked about that. They are uh, organisms that can change their plasma membrane around uh, with pseudopods. They exhibit pseudopodia for locomotion and feeding. They can be naked, like the typical amoeba you, you know about, this uh, amoeba right here. Or they can have a shell. They can, they, can, they, can be, um, they can have a shell of silica. They can be part amoeba inside of a shell of silica. They're actually quite a diverse group of organisms. Amoeba proteus is probably the best studied amoeba, uh, you know, if you think about uh, the typical canonical amoeba in the lab setting, what you think about is the, the tubulina amoeba proteus. This is your typical lab amoeba studied in labs. Another type of amoeba you should know about are these slime molds slime molds uh, again they are a member of supergroup amoebozoa they can be classified as plants animals or fungi it's really interesting remember how protists are polyphyletic and you've got two types of slime molds the mixogastria which are the acellular slime molds and the dictoostelia, which are the cellular slime molds. Moving on to the next supergroup, chromoaviolata. The chromoaviolata. Now we're on our third subgroup of these uh, protists. This is quite a diverse group. You've got members including the aviolata, stromenopiles, the haptophyta. Let's talk about these. The aviolata are br further broken down into the AP complexa dinoflagellates and the ciliophora. Let's talk about the AP complexins. The AP complexins are distinguished by the presence of an apical complex, which we talked about in, I believe, chapter one. Remember the apical complex, the structure that uh, it, it includes the arrangement of fibrils, microtubules, vacuoles located at one end of the cell. This is called the apical complex and the AP complexins possess this apical complex. And the organism that you should know about in this group are called the plasmodium. We studied plasmodium in the protists lab. Plasmodium are intracellular parasites. Remember, uh, plasmodium cause malaria they are spread by the vector mosquito. Um, and once inside the red blood cells, this, this uh, parasite lives inside and causes uh, disease. The dinoflagellates, uh, this is another group. These dinoflagellates are interesting because they cause phosphorescence and toxic blooms seen in seawater. Um, I used to live in San Diego and every so often we would have dinoflagellates in the ocean. So when the waves would crash on the beach, 
you would you would see these blue uh this blue glow in the in the tide and that would be phosphorescence caused by these organisms each has two flagella and it also has a defensive structure a defensive protein called a trichocyst and these cysts uh these trichocysts shoot out and protect the microorganism next group here the ciliates the ciliophora uh, these are really interesting uh, because they include this common species called the paramecium we looked at paramecium in the lab paramecium are ciliated okay they're ciliated and they exhibit cilia for motility they can cause diarrhea in humans and moving on to the stramenal piles, these are very diverse. They include the diatoms, which you know about diatoms. Diatoms are aquatic uh, photosynthesizers. They make up most of marine plankton uh, or a lot of marine plankton. And they account for about 40 to 50 percent of the, the production of organic carbon in the ocean. They, they are responsible for removing a lot of CO2 from our environment and producing a lot of oxygen for us as well. They are quite useful. These diatoms are very, very useful on the planet. There's also the golden and brown algae, the oomycetes and the labyrinthalids, the haptophytes, which include the seaweeds and the kelp. Okay, And what they all have in common is this, this unifying feature, the heterocont flagella. What's a heterocont flagella? Uh, possessing two differently shaped flagella during the modal stage of the life cycle. Remember, uh, these organisms have modal and non-modal stages sometimes in their life cycle. So during their modal stage, they would have this heterocont flagella. Let's talk a little bit more about the diatoms. The diatoms, again, are these aquatic creatures they look really interesting. They look like little gems, little uh, jewels under the microscope. Why? Because they're shiny like this because of their epitheca and their hypotheca, which are structures made of silica. Okay, they're made out of uh, basically sand or glass. You, you could think of it as glass. And the, basically each one of these uh, creatures, some are shaped like little ovals, some are shaped like circles, you can have square or triangle shaped ones. They're quite diverse in shape, but what they have in common, again, is that they look like little petri dishes. The hypotheca would be the small part of the dish, and the epitheca would be the large part of the dish, and the epitheca and hypotheca together give you these fascinating structures. And remember, those are made out of uh, silica. The supergroup, the next supergroup, Archaeplastida. This is, I believe, the last supergroup, Archaeplastida. These ones include a plastid. Okay, these have a photosynthetic plastid. So these organisms include a uh, plastid such as the uh, chloroplast. So let's take a look. Green algae. We've all heard of algae, green algae. Green algae is uh, part of the group Chlorophyta, and there's quite a diverse uh, arrangement. There's quite a diverse uh, uh, subset of these green algae. Spirogyra, for example, are filamentous uh, algae. Volvox is not filamentous. It looks like a large cell with smaller cells inside. It's a very interesting shape. It looks like a soccer ball full of smaller balls. Um, so you can have many different types of green algae. And what are green algae? They are photosynthetic. They have chloroplasts. Uh, they have cellular cell walls, usually. Uh, and they have, like I said, a diverse morphology. There's many different shapes, sizes. Uh, types of cellular arrangement of these green algae. All right, so before we move on to fungi, let's take a little break with TIG and come back, maybe get a coffee, come back, and we'll learn about the next group of eukaryotes, the fungi. All right, let's, let's take a break time.
Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you all got your coffee. Let's finish up this chapter. So, where we left off, we we're about to talk about the fungi, another group of eukaryotic microorganisms. Let's go ahead and get started here. So, the fungi are spore-bearing eukaryotes. Fungi typically are saprophytic. Uh, they're saprophytes, which means they absorb nutrients from dead organic material uh, by releasing digestive enzymes. So when uh, a creature dies, a tree dies, an animal dies, the fungi take over. They recycle those organic materials. They digest and recycle those organic molecules. They are not photosynthesizers. They lack chlorophyll. Uh, instead, they feed on dead uh, organic material, usually. Now, they can reproduce sexually uh, by forming sexual spores or asexually by forming asexual spores. Now, when you become a nurse or a clinician, you'll notice that mycology or uh, the, the term mycology refers to the study of fungi. So anything with the, uh, the suffix, or I should say the prefix uh, uh, myco means has to do with fungi. So mycology would be the study of fungi. Mycologists are the, study of, the scientists who study the fungi. Mycoses are diseases caused by the fungi. And mycotoxicology is the study of toxins from fungi and their effects. So when we're talking about fungi, it's quite a large group, quite a gathering of species. 90,000 fungal species have been described, and there's possibly up to uh, 1.5 million, uh, you know, out there that we have, you know, yet to discover. Six major fung fungal groups exist. The, and we're going to talk about each one. The chytrids or chydidio, uh, chytridiomycota, the zygomycota, glomeromycota, ascomycota, basidiomycota, and the microsporidia, which are really unique, which we'll get to soon. Here are the major branches of fungi. Uh, you don't need to know much about the taxonomy uh, of, with said fungi, but you know, there's many, many different groups. What you should realize though is that the, the fungi are distributed, uh, and or I should say the fungi uh, have different uh, uses to uh, medicine, they have uses in food industry, they have uses in just in nature as decomposers and recyclers. So you can see here that in industrial, uh, in the industrial realm, they are fermenters. They are used to make all kinds of foods for us. You know, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for example, is a baker's yeast. And yeast is used to make bread, wine, beer, uh, other, other fermenters can make cheese, soy sauce, uh, organic acids, certain drugs, antibiotics are produced from fungi. Remember that penicillium uh, produces penicillin. Immunosuppressive agents come from uh, fungi as well. They decompose. The fungi decompose organic material. Uh, and so they keep those organic molecules in our food chain. Some can be pathogenic, though, and we'll talk about pathogenic fungi as well. So the chytridiomycota are the simplest fungi. These are also known as the chytrids. They can be uh, parasitic as well. The, there are parasitic forms of chytrids in animals, insects, aquatic plants, etc. The zygomycota these are known as the zygomycetes. The most are saprophytes. They include the uh, plant, uh, I should say, the uh, bread mold, Rhizopus stolonifer. Remember, we learned about Rhizopus stolonifer, the common bread mold. 
Glomeromycota, on the other hand, are mycorrhizal symbionts. So they form a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with the roots of plants. Uh, they provide osmotic relief uh, to the plant root and also nutrients to the plant root and the plant root uh, uh, provides sugars to the fungi. So uh, they, they benefit one another. The ascomycota, on the other hand, these are known as the sac fungi because uh, the, their, their spores are formed within a, uh, a sac. These include the yeasts and truffles. And then we have the basidiomycota. The basidiomycota are also known as the club fungi. These include very common fungi you may know about, such as the mushrooms, the toadstools, uh, shelf fungi, puffballs, rusts, etc. And lastly, these are probably the most unique of the fungi. These are the microsporidio, and the reason these are so unique is because they are obligate intracellular parasites that infect insects, fish, humans. Uh, they are responsible for human infections, uh, such as the, uh, uh, they can cause the diarrhea, pneumonia, encephalitis, nephritis inside of uh, humans, uh, especially humans that have a compromised immune system, such as HIV AIDS patients. So there you go. Uh, that's a quick rundown of uh, the, uh, or I should say a survey of microorganisms. We started with, uh, in the previous video, we started with the prokaryotes, archaea, and then we started, and then we went off to the gram negatives, then the gram positives, and in this video we, we did a survey of eukaryotic microorganisms as well. So there you go, there's your survey. Hopefully uh, you gained an appreciation for the diversity there exists in the realm of microbiology. And in the next uh, video, we are going to be covering viruses. So viruses are not actual creatures. They're not actual organisms. However, they are infectious agents. And we'll be talking quite a bit about them in the next video. All right, so hopefully uh, you guys are all doing well uh, and you learned something from this video. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.